Well, good evening and welcome to our 12th episode of Dome at Home. My name is Scott Young. I'm the Planetarium Astronomer at the Manitoba Museum. Glad to be back with you for the last show of season one. This is uh, was going to be the end of our run for Dome at Home, but uh, as we mentioned last week, we will be starting season two next Thursday. So you don't even have to wait all summer for the, for the new season to come out. We're going to just start next week. It's uh, really exciting to be back. Um, Mike, as always, is over there in the chat thread and he's got everything all organized and he'll keep me on, uh, on task here. Mike, how's the week going for you? Uh, the week is going by really quickly. I'm, uh, I, I don't know where it's gone to, which is good because that means the weekend's coming up. And that's spring right. break. Yes, spring break. And uh, that's, this is a weird spring break, I have to say. I mean, for us at the museum, usually spring break is you know, nine straight days of manic insanity because it's the week where everybody comes to the museum and, um, you know, the planetarium would normally be open. The science gallery would be open. We'd have all sorts of special programs and things like that. It's kind of the one time that we're never allowed to take holidays because it's just, it's the busiest week of the year. And it's also the end of our fiscal year. So there's all this budget stuff to do as well. But uh, this year, it's kind of weird. I mean, the museum will be open. The, the museum galleries will be open, but the planetarium and science galleries still, still aren't allowed to. So uh, I actually have a few days of holidays during spring break, which is pretty unusual for me. We have uh, a bunch of things on the docket tonight. We're celebrating um, a couple of things. First of all, it's the 25th anniversary today of the Great Comet of 1996. If you remember 1996, you may remember Comet Hyakutake coming out of nowhere and gracing the skies. We'll, uh, we'll take a look at what that looked like and talk about comets and what, they're, what are the chances of having uh, you know, a good comet do that again. Um, comets are there all the time, but bright ones can be kind of rare. We'll be talking about that. We have cool space stuff, of course, and we'll be talking about our spring break programming um, and uh, a spring, a special spring break contest, uh, which uh, some of you have already sent in some videos for us. So those of you that have been waiting to see if your videos get onto the show, today's a, a good day to watch. All right. As always, the stars belong to everyone, as uh, Helen Sawyer Hogg would say. And that's really what the show is about. We're trying to get you familiar with your stars, introducing you to the stars and planets that are visible in the night sky theoretically anywhere in Manitoba. Also uh, a little bit of um, uh, space news and things like that that goes beyond Manitoba. If you're joining us from a, from a distance, you may have to make some adjustments to things like times or directions. But uh, if you are joining us from a distance, definitely say hello, put your, uh, put your name and location in the chat window. That's where we do all of our communication back and forth. For those of you on Facebook or uh, watching us live on YouTube, you can also leave something in the chat there. We love to see where we're, where we're seeing people from around the world. Let's see, we do have a couple of other things to, to celebrate. Um, happy birthday, Carolyn. Uh, your mom, Leslie, was uh, talking to me last week and she mentioned that it was your birthday today. So happy birthday. Congratulations on one more orbit around the sun. Since your last birthday, you have traveled. Um, nearly a billion kilometers. So that's a pretty good chunk of, uh, of travel. We also have, um, one of the things that I love about the show is we get mail from folks. We get images, we get drawings, we get comments and things like that. We love to hear from you. And I wanna show a couple of the, uh, the images that we haven't been able to show uh, so far yet, but they've been coming in. Um, this is a, a, a Mars globe made by Isabella uh, for a school project and I mean, I remember, you know, doing the solar system in grade six and making a styrofoam planet or something like that. And I think it was literally a styrofoam ball with some watercolor paint on it. This raises the bar. Like there's, there's, it looks like there's some clay or, or plaster on there. There's some terrain. There's all these, like, this is, this is realistic stuff. That's pretty darn impressive. So well done, Isabella, on your, uh, on your science fair project. Um, I was talking to David. Uh, he just recently picked up a telescope for him and his uh, family that watched the show and um, just pulled out his cell phone, stuck it to the eyepiece and got this amazing picture of the moon. So this is, you know, this, this is like 
pretty much a first timer in terms of looking at the sky and pulled off a, a great photo of the first quarter moon. So well done, David. And uh, hi, Sebastian and uh, Genevieve and Miriam and Lucas and Alexandra. Thanks for watching the show. Uh, I'd love to see more pictures uh, with you and your telescope. We also had a number of people that reported the Starlink satellites that were uh, visible a week or two ago. SpaceX is launching these rockets full of 60 different satellites and they spit them all out. And eventually the satellites spread out into a nice um, wide pattern and they're, they're not as noticeable. But when they're first launched, basically there's a string of these dots that move across the sky all in sync. And if you catch them in the first couple of days after launch, it really is kind of eerie. So uh, Pat sent in this great shot um, with her phone of, uh, of the Starlink satellites cruising past a, a star there. I hope you can see that. It's a, it's a, little, um, a little dark, but um, really does capture what they look like in the real sky. So well done there. Uh, let's see. And we also have... Um, some images of the Mars landers that I'm going to get to a little bit later in the show, but I, I love to see uh, I love to see that you're going out and doing things. Actually, taking the stuff that we talk about in the show, going into your backyard, looking at the sky, drawing pictures, um, or creating uh, anything based on what we do here. It really uh, boosts the spirits here to know that people are actually taking this into their lives. So that's great. Okay. Let's move on to the sky right now. Now we've had a few clear nights and it's been nice. I've been out with the telescope uh, the last three nights. Tonight doesn't look like it'll be clear, but uh, we had some decent, decent skies the last little while. Of course, at this time of the year, clear means cold. And so it's been dipping down to those minus seven, minus eight kind of things. And I, I feel, oh, I can just run outside. I don't need to put on my gloves. Wrong. Astronomy is not an aerobic activity. You get cold really fast. So don't skimp on the dressing up. It's still winter as far as the sky is concerned. If you're facing the north, you've got the, the circumpolar constellations, the, one that we're, the ones that we're familiar with. We've got our Big Dipper high up in the northeast. We'll be seeing that uh, a little bit later as well. The Big Dipper's two pointer stars always point back to the north star over here. Queen Cassiopeia, the W on the other side of the North Star. So the, the three of those sort of form a line here. Fairly well uh, visible. If you're really lucky and you're out looking at the Northern sky, you may see some Northern lights. There's been some reports of them on and off the last little while. It's really hit or miss. The forecasting of Northern lights is not an exact science. The best way to ensure that you see them is to be out under the sky lots. So go out looking at the stars and uh, that way, if the Northern lights happen, you'll, you'll see them. If we move over to the Western sky. Hmm. There we go. We'll move over to the West here. We're saying goodbye to the winter constellations. Good old Orion the Hunter has been visible for months now. He's getting really, really low in the sky as the darkness falls. It doesn't get dark till 8.30, 9 o'clock now with the daylight savings time jump. And Orion is already low in the Southwest. And if, you, if you're like me and you have trees or buildings in the way, you know, neighbors, that kind of stuff, Orion disappears pretty quick. So you'll want to catch him right after sunset. The belt of three stars around the middle, the, the bright, red giant Betelgeuse there. We still have the planet Mars hanging around. Mars has been visible since we started this show in January. It's been visible since last summer, really. It's, it, it feels like it's been a really long time. I mean, Mike, you probably remember uh, a number of Mars oppositions. We had that great one in 2003. Does it, does it not seem like this one has been exceptionally long? Yeah, I mean, I don't know whether it's just because we've been paying more attention to it because of all the the landers that we've or the probes that we've been sending towards Mars or whether it's just been some, you know, a really mild winter. So we're been out, I've been out observing it a little bit more. But yeah, I, I see your point. It does feel like it's been around a long time. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's one of those things that, it, you know, it's still nice and bright. It's not great to look at through a telescope anymore because it's quite far away. It's at the farthest point almost on its orbit. It's, it's basically going to duck around behind the sun over the next month or so. And so it'll be um, 
basically the entire sky will sort of be moving down into the west and it'll be lower and lower each night. We'll probably lose track of it in a month or so. But uh, it has been a nice long run for Mars and uh, we'll catch it again the next time around, which is, um, I guess, probably September 2022 will be another close approach. So that'll be a good time to, to check out Mars again. Swinging around to the south, this is where our featured constellations, our prime constellations generally are. All the constellations tend to be at their highest when they're in the south. And um, that means they're clear of the trees and, and horizon haze and stuff like that. We've got Gemini up here. We've got Cancer the Crab. Tonight, excuse me, tonight the moon is in Leo the Lion. We've talked about Leo before. Oh, that reminds me, George is a, a cranky cat today. He won't be down, but uh, I will try and post some pictures of him after the show because I took some cute George pictures. So for those of you that like cats, there you go. The, uh, the, the lower part of the Southern horizon here is made up of some pretty faint stars. I mean, you've got, you've got some patterns that are recognizable. You know, if we get rid of these lines, there are a few bright stars in here, but they just don't have the, the pure um, smack you in the face brilliance of something like Orion the Hunter or, or something like that. But we have constellations like Hydra down here. And, um, you know, it, it, Hydra is the snake. Okay, it kind of looks like a snake. But for me, I tend to not really pay attention to those constellations nearly as much, um, just because they are quite a bit fainter and they're hard to see from inside the city. When you're in your backyard or you're looking from your balcony, you got to sort of focus on the brighter stars. And so if you turn to the east, you, go, you start to see some of those brighter stars. Here's our, here's our Big Dipper again. We sort of swung all the way around. So there's the, uh, there's the North Star again and, and North. But if you're facing towards the east, you can still sort of see the Big Dipper here. And the Big Dipper can help us find uh, our featured constellation for the evening. The Big Dipper has a bowl of four stars and then a curved handle of three stars here. And so the handle has a curve or an arc to it. And so there's a sort of a mnemonic, a, a rhyme to remind you, follow the arc to Arcturus. You follow the arc of this handle and sort of keep going with that curve and you wind up at this really bright star over here. This star is called Arcturus and it's one of the brightest stars in the whole sky. So we'll be talking about that and its constellation Boates in our Connect the Dots segment a little bit later. But I like to show sort of how it fits together because the Big Dipper really is a useful signpost for finding a lot of these constellations. Um, Think we mentioned in the past you know you've got the two pointer stars that point up towards the north star they also point down the other direction to leo the lion and you can you can draw lines through all sorts of these stars to to point to different parts of the sky so if you only find one star group the big dipper is a good one to know and then we loop all the way back around to the north so that's the evening sky and normally we focus pretty much exclusively on the evening sky because that's when most people have the ability to go out observing. We're going to do a little bit of a, something different here, though, today. We're going to zap forward in time. So instead of looking at the, you know, 8 o'clock sky, we're going to crank forward to the early morning. And as we get to the early morning sky, you know, the, the sun is almost starting to come up. Let's let's set this to say, oh, how about 5.30? That's a decent time to get up. It's not a decent time to get up, at least not for me. The stars are starting to fade away, but there are two really bright stars. Oh, my head's in the way. Let's just move this over a bit. Off in the Southeast, down really low, there are two pretty bright stars that start to become visible, rising just before the sun does. The brightest one is Jupiter, and the fainter one is Saturn. These are the two planets that we saw in the evening sky back in December. And basically, we have now swung around the sun so that we're looking around the other side of the sun at them. We're, we're now seeing them in our morning sky. They're not right next to each other because each of these planets is also moving around the sun. So they're not still in that close group that we saw in December, but they're starting to poke up in the morning sky. And if you have a good horizon, you can start to watch for those. That's sort of the only other planet um, 
stuff that we can see in the sky right now. So that's why I sort of bring it up. And you really have to catch it quite early in the morning. But if you are up, it's a good time to see those. So there's our sky update for this week. And as, uh, as you noticed, we have the, we had the moon up. We're almost at full moon. Full moon's coming up on the 28th. And uh, so generally the full moon tends to have a damp damping effect on looking at the stars. I mean, you know, we like, to, we like to get out of the city to look at the stars to get rid of all the extra lights. Well, the moon is an extra light that you can't drive away from. It's, if, if it's full moon, that's light pollution that's up there no matter what. And so a lot of astronomers tend to, you know, pack it in during that time. That's when you catch up on your sleep. That's when you uh, do other things that aren't related to the night sky or whatever. But the moon, of course, is fascinating all the time. Um, I see Melissa has just asked uh, about the, the March full moon. Why does it have so many names compared to other months? So the moon has become big business lately. Um, this, it started with the super moon. Actually, it started before then. The, uh, the Farmer's Almanac used to give names to each full moon. They, would, they were allegedly based on um, First Nations name for the moons, although there's some dispute to some of that. And there are also some, um, there are also um, different names from different cultures as well. So often the full moon will be the snow moon or the strawberry moon or the harvest moon. Um, you know, we've heard of that one's probably the most famous, of course. So each moon has all these names. Nobody paid attention to them until someone on the internet suddenly realized that, hey, when we talk about the moon and we give it a cool name, people click on our articles. And so it, it became the super moon. And then suddenly there were a couple of super moons every year. And then it was the super strawberry blood moon from Mars or something like that. And, and it, just, it just got a, out of hand. So I, I think the names of the full moon, um, there are some genuine um, cultural references and things like that. But a lot of the stuff that you see online is actually just someone going through and picking all the names they can find to string them together to make a really long sounding uh, title. So unfortunately, that's the, uh, that's, that's the truth behind the, the naming of the, the, the various full moons. We will, uh, we will talk more about full moons in a future show, actually. Like I say, there are, there are certain cultural ones. Uh, the First Nation one names have uh, some really important significance to the whole pattern of the, of the year. And we'll, uh, we'll bring someone on to talk about those in a future show. Uh, let's see. Um, any questions that have come in, Mike? I, uh, I saw the one that went by, but uh, the, the chat window is just filling up again. So, uh, Yeah, if it's filling up, it's not filling up for me, uh, other than the question about the, the full moon. Uh, Wesley was asking if you could repeat the names of the, of the planets you were talking about uh, just a few minutes ago. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so the two planets, the bright one is Jupiter, and, oops, and the fainter one is Saturn. So the, the, two, uh, the two gas giant planets, Jupiter on the left and Saturn on the right. Okay, so what we would love to see, you know, we, when we talk about this stuff, these are the predictable events. We can predict where the moon's gonna be. We can predict which constellations are visible, where the planets are gonna be and stuff like that because those are regular events. They follow a regular predictable cycle or pattern. We've figured out the math behind it. And all you have to do is, you know, run the math forward to figure out what the future will be like. But the whole universe isn't like that. There are things that just happen randomly. For example, shooting stars. You can be out one night and a shooting star will arc across the sky, burn up in the atmosphere, be a really nice sight. There's no possible way we can predict individual shooting stars. They're, they're just too, um, too numerous and too small for us to see coming. We can predict certain nights where there's a better chance, meteor showers and things like that, but we just can't predict everything because we don't know about everything. Um, and that's sort of where our next topic comes in. In the year 1996, there had been a comet discovered called Comet Hale-Bopp. And it was discovered when it was way out by the orbit of Jupiter and it was a really big bright comet and so it was going to come past the earth in 1997 and it was forecast in advance that this would be a pretty bright comet so people were pretty excited waiting for this comet to get close enough to become visible and people were 
sort of chomping at the bit to see this. And it was discovered by two astronomers, uh, one of whom was an amateur astronomer who was just looking for comets with his backyard telescope and found one. And in 1996, there weren't nearly as many um, gigantic telescope surveys or things like that tr tracking the whole sky. Amateurs could literally go out and look around with their telescope and discover brand new things. That's a lot harder now. However, in January of 1996, while we're all sort of getting comet fever, there was uh, another comet discovered by a Japanese amateur astronomer. Uh, it was called Comet Hyakutake, and it became the Great Comet of 1996. So 25 years ago, this comet zoomed past the Earth. It's the, the closest passage of a comet to the Earth in the last 200 years. It sort of came out of nowhere. We had almost no warning. The only reason that there were so many great pictures taken was because people had already started to get ready for Comet Hale-Bopp the next year. And so um, astronomers were already thinking about, oh, what kind of cameras should I be using for comets and what kind of filters and film and yeah, film um, and, and that sort of stuff. This was a beautiful, beautiful event, and it became a, a huge public event as well. 25 years ago tonight, I was at a city park somewhere in the north end of, uh, might have been Kildonan Park. I think we were in Kildonan Park in one of the big open fields with telescopes with the local astronomy club, and we just had thousands of people down to see this comet. And we had all of our telescopes um, set up to, to show close up, but the view was best with the unaided eye. This is what it looked like to the unaided eye. Maybe not quite so blue, but it looked like a comet. It was, it was beautiful. It was amazing. I was, uh, I was kind of blown away. Because it passed so close, we also got really close up views of all the details of what a comet does, spewing off all these jets and uh, things like that. There was a great uh, animation made by some some Ottawa amateur astronomers that showed the comet actually rotating and spinning off jets uh, that actually provided pretty much the same kind of information that would be confirmed by spacecraft uh, years later. It was really, really incredible. If you remember Comet Hyakutake, you, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Most people didn't even have time to hear about it though. There was you know, a little bit of news on this brand new thing called the internet, but most people weren't on that at that point. And uh, it came out in the local astronomy magazines. But by the time it was, you know, by the time those go to print and get mailed, it was pretty much over. So you really had to be sort of plugged in to, to find out about it, or you had to see one of these public events. Here's a drawing that uh, um, somebody did, a uh, fellow in Japan, I don't know if you can see the whole the whole shape here. Here's the Big Dipper, the seven stars of the Big Dipper. And this is to scale. So here's the two pointer stars that point to the North Star. The comet passed very close to the North Star. The tail stretched, what, at least almost twice as long as the whole Big Dipper. That's That's like half the sky, like looking across the sky like that. Imagine seeing this ghostly finger stretching across the sky. Really, really incredible to see. Probably my favorite sketches is, is this. This is what it this this conveys what it looked like. Now, modern astronomers know what comets are. Comets are snowballs, maybe a few kilometers across. They have a lot of dust and dirt and junk in them. And as they orbit around the sun, if they get close to the sun, they start melting and all that stuff falls off the back and makes the comet's tail. And night after night, this thing will move across the sky. It's usually only bright or visible for you know, a couple of weeks or so, and then it disappears. Imagine if you didn't know that, and you woke up, went outside one night, and saw this ghostly finger pointing across the sky, stretching across half the sky. Comets were seen as evil omens, as bad luck, as all sorts of things um, in the past. It was, and it's not surprising why. This is, this is the kind of thing that broke the order of the heavens. Everything else is predictable. Everything else we can understand Sure, we think they're all gods and goddesses and stuff, but at least we know where they're going to be. But comets just reminded us how little we knew about the universe. And I think that was terrifying. Uh, Kaylee's asking him, when you see a comet, does it go by fast? No, here's the thing. It, it kind of looks like, like a meteor, like a pew, shooting star and, and that kind of thing. Those do go by fast, but a comet is actually there and it moves with the stars. So for example, that one that was by the North Star 
um, the view, the previous view here, that was visible all night long. As the entire sky rotated, the comet would rotate with it. And uh, the same with this one. Eventually, the comet would set below the horizon, just like the sun does, but it would be visible for for a big chunk of the night. And then it would only move from here to say here the next night. And so you'd have a comet sort of stretching up over here. And it was visible for, I think we had about a month of, of time that we could see this thing every clear night. And it was clear a lot. I remember staying up really, really late to, uh, I remember being really, really tired at the end of this. Anyway, I wanted to bring it up partly because I realized it was the 25th anniversary, but also just to remind you how um, unexpected the universe can be. You know, we think we know a lot. We can predict total solar eclipses down to the exact second and stuff like that. We do know a lot, but there's a lot of things that can just come out of left field and surprise us. And that's part of the beauty of, of looking at the sky. And it's also um, part of the fun. I mean, even looking at the Northern Lights, you know, you, you can't really count on them. If you go out and they happen, that's great. Uh, the same with comets, the same with meteors. There's a lot of really um, interesting stuff that can happen that we just can't predict. And the only people that see it sometimes are the people that happen to be out looking at the sky already. So if I haven't convinced you already to get out under the sky, get out under the sky because, you know, we, we might think, oh, it was lucky to see that, but you can kind of make your own luck just by being out under the stars. Oh, lots of comment questions going by. Mike, do you have any that you want to, uh, you want to send in here? Uh, well, you can, you can start with the ones that uh, are up there. Um, uh, Kaylee was asking, when you see a comet, does it go by fast? Yeah, that's, uh, we were talking a little bit about that. It's, it, it's visible usually for many, many nights. And uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't move any faster than the planets do, really. I mean, if, if you think about how Mars has been moving, if we go back to our, to our Mars image. Uh, oh, right. We're not at the right time of the year time of the night sorry let's fast forward back to the evening mars started off down over here and over the last three weeks it's moved to here so i mean that's not a huge mo motion in the sky right so pretty slow and then uh, yeah i see we've got um how big do comets tend to be the actual comet is a few kilometers across but the cloud of gas around it and the tail can stretch for a million kilometers or more and this particular comet, Hakutake, came closer than anything else for the last 200 years. It was about 15 and a half million kilometers away from the Earth. Now, that's still really far. I'm not at all worried about, you know, collisions or any of that kind of stuff. But, you know, it's, it, basically we had front row seats is what I'm saying. So that was, uh, that was good. And, um, and Kim's asking about how they move. Um, these comets move the same way the planets do. They move around the sun and the sun's gravity basically keeps them from flying off in a straight line. If you, uh, you take like, um, oh, what are those? Oh, I can't remember what they're called. You know, it's a lemon, a plastic lemon on a stick, on a string, and then you wrap it around your ankle and then you sort of do this little hop skip thing. I forget what those things are called. Oh. Anyway, you know, when you spin it around, basically the, the lemon just spins around. If that string broke, the lemon would just fly off in a straight line. But the rope, that's gravity, and that's what's holding it back. So same kind of thing with comets, same kind of thing with all of the things in the, uh, in the solar system. Um, Krishna is asking about how fast comets move. You know, eight, nine, 10 kilometers a second. Not, not super fast, but relatively good speed. Um, David's asking, do we know of any comets that will be visible soon? Yes, there is likely going to be a relatively bright comet towards the end of 2021. We, it's, it's another one of those hail bop kind of situations. It was just discovered quite early, and we think that it'll be close enough and bright enough that we'll be able to see it with the unaided eye towards the end of the year. So we'll get more into that later. The thing is, we don't know how bright. Bright like a little fuzzy spot you can see or bright like light up the whole sky. Comets don't really follow a lot of the rules. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, David Levy, who is a comet discoverer and uh, an author and all around nice astronomer guy, he, he did a, a great talk where he basically said, comets are like cats. They both have tails and they both don't care what you think. And, um, you know, because basically the comets will just look like they're going to be bright and then fade away. 
or they'll be inconspicuous and then suddenly burst into the scene and, and uh, sometimes they'll break into pieces. Sometimes they'll do all sorts of things. Very, very unpredictable, just like cats. Um, and Kim's asking, uh, where do comets come from? Do they break off from a planet? Well, you know what? They're actually leftovers from the planets being formed. When the gravity sort of made all the planets together and the sun and stuff like that, the leftovers, the icy leftovers at the outer edge of the solar system, those basically got made into the comets. Uh, let's see, oh, questions about, uh, oh, um, what makes the tail bigger or smaller? Some of the changes are based on how close it gets to us. Some of it's based on how close it gets to the sun. Basically, if a comet gets really close to the sun, it melts a lot more and more stuff sort of falls off and makes the tail. So, uh, and there's also a, um, some, you know, perspective and angles and things like that. Uh, how do astronomers know which asteroids or comets pass us by? So here's something you may or may not want to know. Every week, four or five asteroids fly past the Earth, like within a million kilometers or two million kilometers or five million kilometers or closer than 15 million kilometers, literally several times a week. Space is big though, and we're small. We're a really hard target. So you don't have to worry too much about collisions, but there are a lot of things flying by. And so astronomers basically search for these things. And there are people out there, amateur astronomers, as well as now satellites and, and professional astronomer surveys and robotic telescopes that basically just go out and take pictures of the sky over and over and over again looking for things that move. And they discover all these things. So that's sort of where they come from. Um, let's see. So yeah, the, uh, the comets, we'll watch for one towards the end of the year. But the great thing is we could literally get an email tomorrow saying, hey, there's going to be this amazing comet that just got discovered and you should all drop everything and go outside. There was one just a few years ago, comets near... It was named after a satellite. Anyway, it became super bright, but it was only visible right after the sunset. And I remember seeing it, um, it and it was, it was just amazingly bright, almost as bright maybe as Jupiter or, or something like that, just really, really bright with a beautiful tail, but almost nobody saw it because it wasn't predicted and it lasted for a couple of days and then it already faded away. It wasn't visible from here. So very few people got a chance to see it. Okay, uh, wow, lots of stuff about Neowise. Yes, um, last summer was Comet Neowise. So you may remember there was a fairly bright comet. You could see it with the unaided eye. And um, I got some good pictures of that one. That was a nice comet that was discovered by the Neowise satellite. Neowise is um, near Earth object, something, something, survey, something. Basically it's a, it's a robotic, program that looks for these things. So a lot of these are now being discovered by the robots rather than by the people, uh, the amateur astronomers that, that used to go out and do these, but every once in a while still. Okay. Um, oh, and Susan has one more question. Uh, do comets have elliptical orbits? Yes. They don't go around the sun in a circle. They go in these long ovals. And so one side of the oval is close to the sun. And so it only spends a little bit of its time in close to the sun where it can melt. The rest of the time it goes way out from the sun and winds out being uh, out in the deep freeze. And it's so small that when there's no tail, when it's all frozen, you can't even see it. So it just sort of disappears. And we only see it when it comes in and uh, gets close enough to melt. Okay, let us move on. I can see that comets have some interest here. So I'm making a note to uh, maybe talk a little bit more about comets. I do want to make sure that people will be ready for the, the comet that's coming later in the year. Uh, but it's time for us to move on to our future constellation here. And so let's just press all the right buttons and we will connect the dots with the constellation of Boates or Booties. I think Boates is how it's supposed to be pronounced with the umlaut there, for those of you that speak Latin, but uh, most people call it booties. Booties is the herdsman. He is supposedly up there in the sky um, as a herdsman and he chases the bears across the sky. So in some groups, he's called the bear herder. I didn't realize that that was a real job, but apparently it is. In other... Um, 
stories. He's more of a traditional herdsman and he has some nearby dogs and, uh, and things like that. It's actually made up of what used to be two constellations. Boates was made up of sort of some bright stars in this area here. Um, and here he's holding uh, a pair of nearby hunting dogs, Canis Venetici, the hunting dogs. They're made up of like two stars, so they look like nothing. There's a pile of hair here called Coma Berenices. This is the hair of Bernice, which has a story all to its own. But then up at the top here, we have a constellation called Quadrans Muralis. This is basically um, a quadrant that you would use um, to measure the altitudes of stars and you know, for celestial navigation. It's one of the seven tools of celestial navigation. And uh, it basically allows you to accurately me measure positions and distances in the sky. That was when this atlas was made, which was, I think, 1840. And it's one of the famous ones because it's got all this great artwork and so on. But it was decided that since like there are literally no stars in it that you can see in this particular uh, image, they're, they're made of such faint stars that it didn't deserve a constellation on its own. Quadrans Muralis was labeled obsolete and that area of the sky was just thrown in with Boates. There are a few stars and a few you know, fainter things in that area, but they figured, oh, we'll just, we'll just throw it in with Boates so that we don't have another one. So Quadrans Muralis, uh, became obsolete. And we wind up with this star group. You've got a bright star here, and then you've got sort of a, I don't know, it looks kind of like a big wide necktie. Or actually the, the one that my kids like the best, it's an ice cream cone, and then it has a big blob of ice cream on top. Does not look like a herdsman, but an ice cream cone or perhaps a necktie. You can imagine that this is the part that goes around your neck, and this is the knot, and then hangs down like that. And I've, I've got a couple of ties like that myself. I don't know how you get this image, but regardless, the, the, this shape is actually pretty distinctive. And as we, uh, as we already said, this star here is the star Arcturus, the one you can follow the, the arc of the Big Dipper's handle, follow the arc to Arcturus. So the Big Dipper's up here somewhere, the arc comes down this way and sort of points this out. It's a nice bright, constellation. The stars here, let's move on to our next one here. The, the star Arcturus is actually the brightest star in the northern hemisphere of the sky. It's the fourth brightest overall. I think um, Sirius and probably Procyon and a couple of other ones uh, beat it out, maybe Rigel. But Arcturus is one of the brightest stars that we can see here. And it is very much what our sun will be like in a few billion years. The mass of Arcturus is almost exactly the same mass as the sun. So it has the same amount of stuff in it. It's just that Arcturus is older. And in the way that stars evolve, at least stars like the sun, as a star starts to run out of fuel in its center, it starts to get bigger and bigger and it turns into a red giant star. Arcturus is on the way for, to being a red giant star. It's not quite red yet. It's still sort of orange, you know, partway between the yellow of the sun and, and the red of a red giant. So it's only, it's the same mass of the sun, but it's 33 times as big. So it's a much, much bigger kind of situation. Arcturus is a, like I say, nice bright star, very useful for navigation. It's one that is commonly used in celestial navigation as well. And if you look at it in, in binoculars or a telescope, you can really see sort of the orangey color. Even to the unaided eye, you can sometimes sort of spot that it's not just pure white like the other stars, but has a beautiful color to it. Um, Vivian's saying that uh, she thinks Boates looks like a squid with, with two legs. Yeah, okay, you've got sort of the body up here and then it comes down to the Maybe a couple of tentacles there. Yeah, sure. Okay, squid, that works. I'm only going to point out one other star in Boates. Boates is actually, it's a good constellation because it's made of bright stars. It's a, it's a decent pattern. It's got Arcturus in it, but it doesn't have a lot of um, individual stars that we're going to chat too much about. I do want to point out this one here. This one's called Izar, although it used to be called um, Perchurlama, something like that, which basically means the most beautiful. It's a triple star system 
with white or yellow, orange, and blue stars orbiting each other. And in a telescope, you can see those three stars and they actually look orange and yellow and blue. It's really, really beautiful to look at. So quite a nice star there in, in um, Boates. Some of the other stars in the background here, there's about 10 of them in this constellation that have planets going around them that we know of already. So that's a pretty good proportion as well. And um, like I say, a pretty useful constellation, especially, you know, it comes up in the springtime and it'll be visible spring, summer, right, right towards fall. Oops. So there's our constellation of the month or constellation of the week, connect the dots, I guess. And I think that brings us to, it's almost time for, in fact, it is time for Cool Space Stuff. I hope the, uh, I hope the audio worked that time, Mike, you could hear yourself. Uh, yes, sadly I okay. could. Yes. Okay, good, good, good. Um, so there is some really cool space stuff going on. This is a shot of the underside of the Perseverance rover, Percy, on Mars. And there is this metal pan that has been dumped off the bottom. No, it didn't lose its muffler by going over a rock or a pothole or something like that. This is the protective cover that was being used to cover up the Ingenuity helicopter, which is in here all folded up. It's carried on the bottom. And what's exciting, of course, the, the idea of a helicopter drone flying around is going to be very cool. They have picked the, land, the, the airfield site. They're going to go and put the um, drone down, let it sort of assemble itself, and they'll be flying no earlier than April 8th. So it's not going to happen right away, but they have picked the uh, appropriate landing spot. So not far from where the rover landed, they basically have picked an area that's a an airfield, they've got an area that is the, the flight zone. Um, and, and that's mostly defined just, obviously there's no other aircraft or anything to worry about, but just so the rover has good sight lines to communicate back and forth and to take pictures because the drone doesn't have its own method of communicating back to earth or communicating with the orbiting spacecraft as a relay station. It has to talk to the rover. So they wanna make sure that all those sight lines are clear and it's gonna be, uh, quite a nice uh, view. And basically they're, they're, all they wanna do is take off and land. That's the, that's the test. If it does that as a su success, anything else is gravy. But they are gonna fly around, take some pictures, look at potential new landing sites, but they're gonna land back in the, in the, the first place to start. Eventually, you know, if the first flight works, they'll probably be a little braver on the next flight. We might start going farther afield and stuff like that. So it'll be kind of interesting to see exactly what ingenuity does but i just cannot wait to see this tiny little helicopter flying around on mars we'll get to see you know the view from perseverance and then we'll get to see these amazing drone images from uh, from the helicopter itself i really hope it works it, it is a test mars has very little air the air is super thin um thin enough that there might not be enough air for the rotors to sort of push on to lift the thing off the ground. It's very light. It's got really powerful engines, but we still don't know. So it'll be really interesting to watch. And that'll be happening, you know, a week or so after spring break. So that'll be fun to watch. We also, we'll just let that run out because, hey, helicopters. If it does work, I forecast a run on the local Canadian Tire drone department because everybody's going to want one. Now, we've talked about Mars. We've done a whole bunch of Mars stuff recently and we're excited about Mars. We also did a Mars lander challenge and we're bringing that back for spring break. One of the activities that we have for our spring break activities is a challenge to all of you to make a Mars lander. And we've had a few people already do it. For example, uh, my friend Amy uh, sent this in early in the, in the process. She was sort of making a, a lander, getting it all together and um, I'll, let you, I'll let her tell her. Just some paper with some of napping of this stuff. And then there's this 
and then there's this extra bag on the outside. It's this little clothes thing. Mm -hmm. They use to close it, so it's open. Close and take this. This bag has the egg in it, paper towel. Paper towels are cut in half, then folded, help it take one side, and then I fill them up with a bit of yarn so it's more cushy. And then this back here is the parachute. It is taped on my four. So there's the theory. And then ultimately it comes down to the test flight, which was uh, successful, I understand. What we're asking people to do, and you can download this sheet from the website uh, starting on spring break, but what we're asking people to do is to take an egg pilot, build something that will allow people to, uh, will allow the egg to survive a fall of about two meters, six and a half feet or so. You can do it uh, like Amy did, where you throw it out the window. Um, Kaylee and her sister did the same kind of thing where they were just were standing up on chairs and then dropped it from a height. Ooh, that's a hard landing. The pilot survived. Um, lots of padding, I guess. You may want to look at different ways to, to slow the thing down. Anyway, if you do this and you uh, tag the video, put it online or, or email it to us, we've got some, uh, some special stuff to send to all the folks that, are, that participate. I love it when people try these open-ended challenges. You know, you've got a solution, you've got a problem that needs a solution. There's no instruction manual. There's no this is the way to do it. You just have to try a bunch of stuff. That's what NASA does. That's what engineering is. And so it's great to see folks getting involved in that. So check out our Mars uh, egg lander challenge that will be happening uh, throughout spring break. And the people that have already sent in, you can, you can enter again if you want, or you can keep this entry and, and it's all fine. We've got everybody's uh, contact information. So thank you all for the folks that have sent stuff in. There we go. It's alive. It worked. It worked. So spring break is coming up. Before we get to spring break, Earth Hour. Now you've probably heard of Earth Day. That's a sort of environmental kind of day where there's a whole bunch of programming. Earth Hour tries to be a little less ambitious. The idea is, you know, we, we use a lot of energy. And we use a lot of electricity. If you've ever tried to go, to go outside and look at the stars, you know that even at nighttime, people are using lots of lights. The idea is during Earth hour, we stop using energy for an hour. And it only it happens on the 27th. So that's, uh, I guess, this Saturday at 8.30 p.m. local time. We, people, are, uh, people that want to participate, just turn everything off for an hour. You can sit outside it'll still be relatively dark you can use candles or whatever but the idea is to keep your electricity off and uh, there's a bunch of activities that go along with this it's kind of a neat thing to do just to to remind ourselves of how dependent we are on that energy and it it, it has the effect also of you know if people ask about it 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 lets us talk about you know the fact that oh you can see the stars better when the lights are off and so on so it kind of ties into to the astronomy theme as well. If you're interested in that, check out their, uh, their website, earthhour.org. And uh, we're gonna be doing some, some stuff uh, uh, at my place, turning off the lights and stuff like that. So uh, I hope you'll join us. Let's see here. Mike, we have a couple of, uh, oh, there's, our, there's an example of our worksheet, which is gonna be on the, on the website. It's a fairly simple thing with the, all the rules, but uh, and a little bit of inspiration for you. Mike, do you have any questions from uh, social media or from the other spots that you want to uh, bring forward? I, I managed to catch most of the, the questions coming up on uh, on Facebook uh, and YouTube. Uh, so thank you to all of those who were asking questions there. Uh, although something interesting, and I don't know, Scott, I don't know if you uh, heard about this. Uh, Vic was pointing out on Facebook, uh, apparently there is a nova that's become visible through telescopes um yeah in the constellation of cassiopeia do you know anything about that i, I was i was saying that I'm, i'll suggest it as a future episode topic but yeah I, I i do know about it normally it's the it's the kind of thing that we tend not to cover uh on the show like this just because it, it does require a little bit more to see but it you know it's a cool story so here's cassiopeia and basically um cassiopeia is sort of right in the milky way here we'll make it a little darker here and basically lots of stars in that area and you know, when you look there with binoculars, you'll see 
many, many more stars that you just can't see with your unaided eye. Well, one of those stars went nova, which basically meant it got super bright compared to what it was. Now, super bright is relative. It's, it's about a million times brighter than it was, but you still need a small telescope to see it. It's, uh, it's still quite faint, but it sort of came out of nowhere and suddenly peaked in brightness. And now by studying exactly how it fades out, astronomers can figure out well what exactly went on there. And we think that novas are actually come from two, a binary star, there's a, there's a big star, and then there's a tiny little white dwarf star orbiting around it. And the white dwarf star and the big star are close enough that stuff can actually fall from the big star over to the white dwarf. And so the white dwarf is sort of almost eating the, the bigger star. And the gas from the bigger star builds up and builds up and builds up until there's so much of it that it basically explodes and there's this huge burst in brightness. And then the process begins over again. So these novas actually happen more than once. It's just that usually, you know, it's several hundred years between between things. But so the um, let me see if I can remember exactly where it is. It's over in this part of the sky, if I recall. But it is something that even binoculars won't show it to you. You need a small telescope. Yeah, Scott. So, actually, yeah, that's um, if you take the 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 right hand uh, part of the W and yep. follow it towards Cepheus there. It's about halfway in between C oh, okay. and yeah. Um, oh, great. So over in this area. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, I downloaded the coordinates because I thought I might try and take a picture of it the other night and uh, I just haven't gotten around to it, but yeah, it, it's, uh, it's kind of cool stuff like that. Again, happens surprisingly often. There's usually um, several Nova a year that happen somewhere in the sky, but this is a nice, a nice one for you know people in our part of the world because it's in a constellation we can see and it's relative like i say it's relatively bright if you have a camera and a telescope you can uh, you can get images of it cool all right okay so um this pretty much brings us to the end of our show uh we're just gonna talk a, a little bit about next week so this is the end of season one season two starts uh next week with uh on April 1st. Uh, I don't know how we got saddled with that date, but that's okay. April 1st should be a fun show. We're gonna be running a special spring break program uh, for, for Dome at Home. Uh, still starts at seven o'clock. Uh, it's a full length planetarium show called Invaders of Mars, which is all about the various things that uh, we as humans have sent to Mars. And we'll have updates from the, the uh, upcoming uh, or the, the, the newest spacecraft that have arrived there. I'm still hoping to get more information and more images from both the Chinese and the uh, United Arab Emirates spacecraft. They're still very, very quiet in terms of what's come out, but that'll be next week. And then uh, the following Thursday, we'll be into season two of Dome at Home. We'll be doing uh, all the stuff that's in the sky, constellations and all the different things that uh, you've come to expect from us. So and Scott, if I can just uh, quickly uh, chime in here. Uh, next week's episode will not be on Zoom. Uh, it'll be on Facebook Live and YouTube right. Live. Uh, but the future episodes uh, um, throughout the rest of April, uh, there will be a registration for all of the April episodes. Uh, and that link will be going on our website, uh, hopefully tomorrow, but early next week for sure. So people can still see those other episodes on Zoom, but not the one on April 1st. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah, with uh, with all the spring break stuff going on, there's uh, there's a, a little bit of conflict with the with the facilities that we've got. So you can join us on Facebook. Uh, if you're not a social media person, you do not need an account to see us on YouTube Live. So you can just go to the YouTube um, page and search for Manitoba Museum and catch it there. Thanks everyone for coming, and uh, I hope you get out under the sky. And before the before the mosquitoes start getting out there, get out there and catch Orion before he disappears and catch the last of the winter constellations. Thanks again. We'll see you next week and uh, see you somewhere under the sky. Have a great weekend.